Welcome to Valley Church, everybody. It's great to see you guys. Um, I was gone last week, wasn't feeling well, time to stay away, and good to go, and glad to be back. Um, if we haven't met before, my name is Michael. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, we, our church, Valley Church, exists to be a family of missionary disciples. That's our mission, and we hope and anticipate that as, as we become that, as we become a family of missionary disciples, that... Um, our vision slash the vision of scripture would become more of a reality, which is that God's kingdom would come um, not just on earth as it is in heaven, but in Salem as it is in heaven as well. And we're taking the month of September to talk about this mission and vision. We do this um, every year, at least for the last two years. Um, Last week, Mark spoke about what it means to be disciples. Um, if you missed that, you can catch up on our podcast probably like tomorrow afternoon. I'll probably edit that podcast and this one tomorrow, and then you can catch up. Um, but this week, we'll talk about what it means to be a family of disciples. So um, as Mark said last week, a disciple is a, a student or an apprentice of a teacher. They follow the teacher around. They learn from this teacher. They learn to think like him, live like him and really to become like him. And that's our goal as followers of Jesus. We're not just Christians who can like check boxes of things that we believe are true. Um, we are disciples. We are followers of Jesus and his way of life. That's what we believe it means to be disciples and Jesus followers. So imagine like it's the first century, um, you're a, a fisherman in Galilee, and you meet this teacher and you think he's something special. In fact, you think he might be more than a teacher. He's maybe some kind of prophet or maybe even the Messiah who you were just waiting for to come and deliver you from your Roman oppressors. He invites you to follow him, and so you do. And unless you are the first one to be called by Jesus or this teacher to follow, um, you are also, if you choose to say yes to follow this teacher, you are going to be um, physically with the other followers. That, I know that's like very obvious, but if there's other people that have already said yes, we'll follow you, teacher, and then he invites you and you say, sure, if you want to actually follow him around where he goes, you're going to be doing so with the other people that have also said, sure, we'll follow you. Um, at this point in time, in the first century with, with Jesus of Nazareth, there's no such thing as following Jesus on your own. Um, if you want to be a disciple, you're sitting in a circle of others who are also following him. It's not just you and Jesus, it's you, Jesus, and all his other followers. And so it's into this context of all the people following him that Jesus provides the image or the metaphor for the kind of relationship that his disciples would have with one another. And it's not the obvious, it's, we're not like co-classmates. We're not just students kind of sitting in the same classroom learning from the same teacher. Um, that would seem the obvious one. Um, we are students or apprentices under Rabbi Jesus, but we are not classmates. The metaphor that Jesus gives us is family. That is the word that he uses to describe the kind of relationship that his followers would have with one another. Now, that word family would carry um, a very different kind of weight and meaning to Jesus's culture than it does to our own. And yes, family can be very important to us today in our culture, but it was on a whole different level in the first century in Israel. And so I wanna talk just for a bit about the kind of some key differences between how we think about family and how someone in Jesus's time might. Um, this is, if you've been here for our other vision series, this is probably review. I don't remember things I said a year ago, so I don't know why you would, so I'm, I'm saying it again. So um, today, here in America, in the West, 21st century, we are what's considered a weak group culture, or a culture of individualism, or some would say a culture of radical individualism. So in cultures like ours, um, individuals find our identity through the process of self-discovery. Just all you have to do is think about every Disney movie ever being about the main character trying to figure out like who they are, what their purpose is, and it's usually kind of breaking free from the expectations of their family and learning to do what it is that they're supposed to do to fulfill their destiny. Um, so we make decisions in our culture based on our own desires and goals and dreams and with the idea of kind of figuring out who you're supposed to be and that is really kind of one of the highest goals we have is 
being true to ourselves. Who am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to do? And I'm going to go do that. And that's really the best thing I could do for everyone is to be me and to be me well. Um, thinking about like kind of the three big decisions that we make in our culture. What are you going to do with your life? What's your job? Or uh, who are you going to spend your life with if you're going to get married? And where are you going to do this? Where are you going to live? All of those decisions can often be made um, individually, or at least with the um, kind of the end goal being the fulfillment of the individual. We want to do something. We want to do work that makes us happy. We want to be with someone that makes us happy. We want to live somewhere that makes us happy. And even if you end up deciding to live near your family, that can be self-motivated. Self -motivated. I want to live near my family because that makes my life better for me. Even think about kind of the goal of parenting sometimes is described as like, raising up your children to become like successful, grounded, independent adults who can successfully determine like the, the job they want to do. They can go off to college and start a career and find a spouse. And it's pretty normal when kids kind of leave the nest and go start their own life doing their own thing. I'm describing this and you're like, yeah, that's, that sounds normal. That sounds like our life. Um, so for most people, your primary loyalty as you become an adult shifts away from your family of origin and it shifts to your um, spouse or your children if you have any, and it remains your primary loyalty to yourself, to kind of trying to fulfill your own calling, your own destiny, your own life purpose. Now, this way of thinking is uniquely Western and very, very modern, and it feels very normal to us, and I'm not saying that it's necessarily wrong, but it's very different than the culture that uh, Jesus speaks um, the words that we're about to read into. So Jesus' culture, the first century Mediterranean culture in ancient Israel, um, are the opposite of a weak group culture. They are a strong group culture or a collectivist culture. Um, and there are many cultures today that still operate this way. Um, but in this type of society, an individual finds their identity through the groups that they belong to. And individuals are expected to kind of make decisions that prioritize the good of the groups that they belong to over themselves. And in Jesus's culture, the most important group that you could belong to was your family. Um, so it was very common and kind of expected that you would work in your family's trade. Um, if your dad was a fisherman, then that's probably what you were going to do. Um, and then within this, like the most important group is your family. But within that, your most important loyalty within your family was to your blood siblings. That society was called patrilineal, like that's where the... Um, your closest ties came to those who you were related to through your father's bloodline. And so this was true even if you were married, you would often remain closer to your siblings from your father's line. If you were married, it was likely arranged um, by your family for the benefit of your family. And so um, it was common for people that were married to have closer or deeper friendships with their brothers or sisters. So. In the time of Jesus, um, they are a strong group, collectivist culture. Individuals prioritize the good of the groups that they belong to over their own personal desires. The most important group was their family and especially brothers and sisters. So into this context, uh, let's open to Mark chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 31 through 35. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, around Jesus, and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. The most important people in your family group are outside requesting to talk to you. And Jesus says, in verse 33, who are my mother and my brothers, he asked. And then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. So Jesus establishes, it's kind of easy to just kind of gloss over that and to kind of move on. But Jesus establishes family as the metaphor that his disciples, the kind of relationship that his disciples would have with one another. Um, and he said this with his actual family in the room, or at least nearby, which would have been shocking, if not offensive. So Jesus has just attempted to reprioritize 
your, um, their chief kind of cultural and like ingrained societal loyalty, the people that they um, deeply believed, the, the ideal that they deeply believed was just so true and so normal, which was to um, align yourself and be loyal to your family. Jesus was flipping it on its head and he's saying that your actual family, your true family, is now the family of God. And this is still every bit as true and applicable and valuable and authoritative today as it was when Jesus, Jesus first said it, though we might need to kind of apply it differently. So if you would be an apprentice of Jesus, he requires that we are willing to let him establish our priorities of allegiance, um, that he would get to establish those, and namely that he would he would be the one that we are loyal to, including he and his family. So he has invited us into a strong group family where we show our love for Jesus by our love and our faithfulness to our brothers and sisters, to his family. So there's three kind of primary ways that we hope to live this out in our church. Um, and these come, we've talked about this, it's come, it comes from a book called When the Church Was a Family. Um, it was a wonderful book. I would highly recommend that you read it. Um, but there's three principles that kind of capture what it means for a church to live like a first century family. Um, and those are we share our stuff with one another, we share our hearts with one another, and then we stay, embrace the pain, and grow up together. So the first one, we share our stuff with one another. When a family is healthy, they share their belongings. Um, let's look at Acts 4.32. We're just going to kind of blitz through a few passages here. Um, Acts 4, 32 through 35. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. So God's grace was so effective in changing this community, this church family, that it resulted in no one being in any kind of need among them. They all had exactly what they needed. So we're not telling, I'm not telling you to like sell your things and bring the money here. I'm asking you to eventually know one another well enough to know the needs that exist so that you can meet them. That's the, that's the idea, that we share our stuff with one another. Um, 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. Almost there, hold on. Okay. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. So according to John, there's this a direct correlation between how deep the gospel like goes into our hearts and our souls and how well we take care of the actual physical needs of our church family. Not just the poor, though that matters, and not just the homeless, though that definitely matters too, but specifically the brothers and sisters that you are part of the same church family. Those are the people that we need to take care of. And our providing for one another is a tangible expression of the gospel. When we, when we take care of each other, we kind of are, are proclaiming to the world that Jesus has been gracious with us and generous with us, and we have what we need, and we can um, give what he has given us, which ultimately belongs to him, to others around us. Um, so we want to do that. Um, that's the first thing. We share our stuff with one another. The second thing is we share our hearts with one another. So for a church to be family, the expectation is that we would grow to deeply love one another, um, that our affection and our our emotions for each other um, should be cultivated over the course of time. This does not happen quickly. It happens over a long period of time, and it certainly happens through the power of God's Spirit in us, but it should happen. We should grow in our love and affection for one another. Um, really quickly, Romans twelve fifteen tells us to rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn, to empathize, to step into what we imagine other people are feeling, or rather to let them tell us what they feel, and to imagine and to step into that and to join them in what they feel. That is to 
to share our hearts with people, to rejoice with people who are rejoicing, and to enter into the pain and sadness of people in our church family. God expects us to enter into that with our brothers and sisters. Finally, 1 John 4, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. And whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. So as with the first kind of family rule of sharing our stuff with one another, um, in this we also find a direct gospel link where our, our salvation is personal and it, and it is on an individual level where our relationship with God is made right, but it's not private and it doesn't stop with us. When God rescues us, he joins us to his family. And so I think what John is saying in this passage is that a heart that has been um, resurrected and um, changed by Jesus will not on a long enough timeline, will not remain closed or hard-hearted to another brother or sister. Like, how can the Spirit of God exist um, in a heart that also harbors hatred and ill will towards another brother or towards another child of God? It doesn't make sense. And so we want to, we need to, and it's evidence of the gospel working in us to develop love and affection for one another, um, to share our hearts with each other. Uh, finally, the third thing is we stay, embrace the pain, and grow up with one another. So when the church lives like an actual family, we um, wound each other, and we say, and we do stupid things. Um, but we also stick around when things get difficult. We embrace the pain from the wounds that we inflict on each other, and we actually accept these things, these circumstances, as God's invitation to become more like Jesus, and we grow together. Um, so first thing, Jesus uh, expected, he knew that we would need to do this. Um, so let's flip back to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18, verse 15. If your brother or sister sins... Go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. So he, right here, Jesus is under the impression that this is probably going to happen, that you're going to wound each other and you should work on these things together. And then later, in um, just farther down in the passage, verse 21 and 22, Peter comes to Jesus and asks, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Jesus knew and knows that his family needs to do the work of forgiveness and reconciliation, and he expects us to do it over and over again. Um, Paul also um, confirms this and reiterates it in Colossians 3. Um, 12 through 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. We are instructed to bear with one another, which implies we're going to have to persevere through something together with people that are doing things to us or doing things around us that make it hard to be, hard to want to stay around them and to stay with them. We have to bear with one another and be patient with one another. Um, similarly, in Ephesians chapter four, I'm gonna read kind of a few verses scattered through chapter four, verses one through three. Um, as a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Again, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Moving down to verse 15. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Finally, verse 29 through 32. 
Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ forgave you. So Paul has now repeated this expectation that we bear with each other in love through the power of the Spirit and forgive one another. And he also expects that we build each other up. So God has designed this church that we are a part of so that its members, you and I, um, brothers and sisters, that we build each other up, that we help each other become, become more like Jesus through our conflicts, through the need to bear with one another. Um, we become more like Jesus when we press into those moments and those kind of seasons of pain and into our conflicts, and we allow God to work in us, and we're patient as God works in those around us as well. Um, our church family is where we put into practice the things that God teaches us. It's the context in which we learn to need to be humble and learn to kindly express how and when we've been hurt, where we learn to forgive and to reconcile. It's where we learn to encourage each other, to lovingly correct because this is our family. We stick around even when things get hard because that's how God's family is supposed to operate. And it is all too easy to cut and run when someone says something to you and it makes you feel uncomfortable, it hurts you, and you're like, I don't wanna have to deal with this and so I'm just gonna go somewhere else. And there is a time and a place to go to a different church as okay, and no church that exists now would exist if someone didn't leave another church to go start that church, so clearly it's okay for new churches to start, but we also have to stick with people through the wounding that we do to each other so that we can grow together because we are a family. Jesus calls us family. We at, a, at our church, I, I just like those three ways of thinking about what that means, that we share our stuff with one another, we share our hearts with each, with each other, and we stick together through conflict. So my question now, the thing I'm thinking about now that I've been thinking about all week is why is this, um, it feels especially important and especially hard right now to live this out. I don't know if you feel that as well as me, um, but all of us uh, in some way right now are being pulled or pushed or both. Um, the pandemic has ravaged our country, and I, I'm not speaking to it being about it being ravaged medically. I'm talking like socially and relationally and emotionally. Anxiety and depression have significantly risen over the past year, uh, past two years. Um, our relationships, maybe not necessarily those inside this church family, but in general, I feel like relationships feel extremely fragile. Like I'm wondering who in my life is going to say something uh, that's gonna make me think like, oh, you're one of those people. Or who, what am I gonna say that's gonna make someone else in my life think, oh, you're one of those people, I get it. Um, cancel culture isn't just about like deplatforming famous people, it's trickled down to us lowly average citizens. There's too many issues and too many perspectives and the emotions are all running too hot and we are, it seems like two seconds or two sentences away from losing a relationship with someone or getting canceled in their eyes because we read and believed a different article or don't trust the same person or the same organizations or we just see the world differently. And when maybe in another time you could respectfully disagree, that dialogue doesn't seem to have a place um, right now. Everyone and their mom is clamoring for moral high ground, attempting to explain why what they believe is morally good and in turn why they themselves are morally good or, or at least intellectually correct for believing what they believe. Um, we're like striving and panicking, clawing for this ability to say, I see things right and I understand what's going on. And in this chaotic, frantic search for the moral and intellectual high ground, the collateral damage is relationships. People have stopped being people to one another 
or they've stopped viewing others as people. Rather, people, when you look at someone, they've become a carrier of not just a, of like a virus, but they're carriers of um, bad ideas or misinformation. They've become a symbol of the moral and intellectual low ground, symbols of the ideas um, that you think are the real problem with the world today. So someone says something and you don't like it and you look at them and you don't see a fellow human being made in the image of God that you disagree with. You see a mindless mainstream sheep. Or someone says something that you don't like and you don't see God's beloved child. You see an uncaring, ignorant, anti-science conspiracy theorist. Now, I don't know what that means for our culture or like the political dialogue that is well beyond my pay grade and interest. Um, but I can tell you that this kind of thinking is and will continue to destroy the kind of family relationships that need to be cultivated within the family of God. And that's really the only area where I feel any semblance of interest and authority to speak into, which is specifically our church family. Um, and so there's two ways where I see that kind of viewing people as carriers of ideas is, is really um, threatening to harm. One, you might actually start treating people in God's family like the rest of the world is treating others, carriers of ideas rather than human beings made in God's image and dearly loved by him. And you might forget that though they see the world or the pandemic or politics differently than you, they are still your brother or sister. And in this strong group family that Jesus has invited us into, what they think about politics or the pandemic or something else is categorically less and less important than your bond with them as blood siblings, the blood of Jesus Christ that we share. The second way that this is kind of threatening to cause problems, and I think it's maybe the more dangerous one because it's a little bit more subtle. It's the one that I 100% know is creeping up in my spirit and maybe in you as well, which is um, we see the, like, the relational carnage. We see the news articles, the Facebook comment wars, the Instagram, whatever they're called, I don't know. You see people that you know talking or posting about what they think, and you're like, man, if they knew how much I disagreed with them, I wonder what they'd do or if we'd still be friends. But we see all this happening, and we just want to retreat. Um, we want to distance ourselves or self-protect, or maybe we isolate. We keep people at like a certain depth of friendship. We kind of limit the things that we talk about. We don't want to get too close because we'll probably disagree on something at some point, and then we can't be friends. So this pressure, like this fear, the, the distancing, the pseudo-isolation, or maybe the actual isolation, um, it is not conducive to cultivating the loving, committed, and safe relationships that we need to have within the family of God. Um, I like, deeply feel um, the, the pull to isolate and self-protect. I want to have peace and like harmony in my relationships, and that means that I will like, not talk about things if I think that we might disagree on them. Um, and so as much as I had ever done, I, I'm I wrote this and I'm preaching it to myself and reminding myself that I cannot continue to isolate and to kind of pull back and put up walls because I can go to church. I can put on a church service, um, but not be a part of a family of disciples. You can attend church, but not be part of a family. And we don't want that. We don't want to just be disciples who believe a certain set of truths. We want to be the family that God has called us to be. And so I'm asking you, as my church family, um, if you feel like you had your guard up or your weapons out, would you lay them down, the weapons of information and opinion? And would you just join me in, in attempting to let your guard down so we can continue to know one another, to share life with each other, to share our hearts with each other, to let our guard down enough that we're willing to get close enough to wound each other so that we can stay and embrace that pain and grow together. And I want to ask you to help me to build that culture in our church where we're safe to just be 
and safe to develop good, healthy, close friendships with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, for some of you, it might not be even so much about um, relational conflict or the fear of offending someone or being offended. Some of you don't care, and I um, respect you for that. Um, maybe. Maybe it's just the, for you, though, the ups and downs and the ins and outs of life in the pandemic. Like, which, which places are open, which are closed? Have their hours changed? Are we requiring masks or are we not? Are we requiring vaccinations, proof of vaccination, negative COVID test? How many people can sit at this table and so on? All the different like factors, and I've done like half of them, all the different things that we've had to remember and balance and weigh has taken a toll on just our interaction with society and with the world. And maybe those complications have made you want to withdraw a little bit, kind of like a, a voluntary shelter in place of defeat. I get it. Um, it's hard to attempt to invest again and to engage again and to press into relationships when we don't know what's going to happen in a week or in a month or in six months. We don't know if we'll have to go back to online church or if the government will outlaw our communities that are gathering in our homes with people from different households. And like, it's hard to be warm and engaging and hard to feel seen and known with a mask on. I like understand this. There's really nothing going on right now in our world that makes pressing into the whole church's family thing feel natural or easy. It feels the opposite. It feels difficult. It feels the opposite to me. Everything in me wants to just like check out. Um, but I don't want to just phone it in and like put on a church service, call it a day, and go back to normal. I need to and I want to walk through life as the kind of family that God um, designed his church to be. And I, want, I need you to press into that with me. And uh, the best way, at least at this point, that I kind of think we can cultivate this um, uh, church as family thing is through deeply committed communities that get together outside of this room. Um, so in February of 2019, right before the first lockdown, that's when we started our communities. Um, and they have all weathered through the ups and downs of the last year and a half. My own community started with some people I know very well, some people I kind of knew, and some people I didn't know at all. And we have remained committed to each other um, throughout the pandemic. And I can honestly say that we all love each other. We care about each other deeply. We have uh, showed up for each other when we needed each other. Um, we have started to become and are becoming, I think, part of what this family of God is supposed to look like. And it is not like this magical honeymoon phase. It's, it's good. It's really, really good. Um, and I'm confident that each of the other groups can and have said the same thing or similar things about their communities. They've stuck with each other, grown in their love for each other, met each other's needs, and have become a family of disciples. And so I'll close by saying, um, the worship band can come on up here. Um, to those of you who are in a community, um, I want to just plead with you to stick with it. Through the ups and downs that may have happened already, through the busyness of your life, through the conflicts that you've had, everything that's happened, I just want to ask you, plead with you, would you consider continuing to stick with it? And I know that there are ups and downs. There are things that happen and bumps and times where we can't be there. But I just want to ask you, would you consider to just stick with it, to stick with your church family? If you've been around Valley Church for a while and you aren't in a community, we'd love to talk with you about joining one. Um, we have an intentionally slow process for making that happen because we don't want our communities to feel um, transient or inconsistent, which can kind of makes it impossible to become that kind of family with those close relationships where we're sharing our stuff and sharing our hearts and embracing the pain of conflict together. That can't happen when you're not sure who's going to be there from week to week. And so we have a very kind of deeply committed philosophy for these communities. So the process is slow and careful and thoughtful and prayerful. But when there's a new group available or a room to join, we want to help plug you in. And so if you're interested in being a part of one, um, come find me or Mark. Um, Mark is the, the pastor of our communities and would love to help you find a spot. Um, but our goal as a church is to be a family. That is our mission, 
to be a family of missionary disciples. Um, we want to be so much more than people who sit together um, on a Sunday. And frankly, we need a lot more than that if we are going to make it through life and continue to follow Jesus together. And so, um, again, I just want to invite you to keep pressing into this mission with me of being a family of missionary disciples who want to see God's kingdom come in Salem as it is in heaven. Let's pray. God, I pray that your, um, your call and invitation to us to follow you and to do so with other brothers and sisters, that you would, um, I guess, God, that would, I ask that you would inspire us with that picture of imperfect, sinful people who um, are in conflict with one another and disagree with one another and fight um, with that picture of what's, what seems like it shouldn't work, yet it does, would you inspire us with that concept that we could link arms with our brothers and sisters who call you Lord despite our differences and our frustrations and our conflicts, that we could link arms and pledge ourselves to one another because we are pledged to you. Would you help us to experience um, what it means to be a family, not just co-church attenders, not just um, classmates who learn the Bible, but a family who um, is aware of each other's needs and can meet them, is aware of each other's hurts and triumphs and joys and shares in those together and is willing to stick with each other through um, all the pain and the conflicts that we have. God, we love you and you've asked us to be a family and so would you help us to follow you and obey you in that. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.